let's see how it goes. So in order to get the kit to work, my Windows machine is my bag. Mike came up with this fantastic machine called a Mac. Uh, I went from PowerPoint to Keynote and made some last minute edits while we were waiting. So let's see what happens, right? <laughs> so there we go. Um, all right, so I want to talk about scaling down in a conference as we talk about scaling up. Now, there's always this many people at this conference, which is awesome, which means all of you are trying to scale up in some way. I've spent the last few years working with a few teams, some startups, some enterprise. Current gig is a really big company, lots of hundreds of millions of customers that actually deploy just 10 to 12 times a day into production, only 10 to 12 times, um, with like 300 million customers, completely manually. I'm not advocating that you do that, <laughs> but it changed my perspective. So I want to talk about what I've seen. You can't have a conference at a, so you can't be at a software dev conference without having XKCD up, right? And this is about scale, okay? Oh. You see this keynote, the highlights are off. It says sense of scale, once our scale. It's all about scale, right? And it gets more and more ridiculous as we go along, right? And it says we don't have sprinklers, etc. And then the interesting thing is that there's always one person who agrees with whatever the crazy ass solution is. <laughs> like, yeah, that makes sense. And there's always someone person who focus on the most innocuous detail and think, do we really need that part? You know, like it is the defining part of the entire architecture. But that's not what we're about. What I've noticed is that we end up here because the architect said, I need to scale. And you know it's an architect, it's a manager architect, because of the suit. And it's a white guy. <laughs> but not his fault. Not his fault. I'm going to back the person. Because business asked the person before in a closed room discussion, will it scale? And you know it's business because they measure scale like this. <laughs> Does that, right? which is now the international symbol or thing for scale. So this is the problem that I see. It's this thing about, will it scale? I need it to scale, and then we come up with some crazy mechanism, and then we proclaim we scaled, right? But it's the wrong conversation. It is absolutely the wrong conversation. The question you need to get when you get that weird expression is, ask the people in your business, what do you want to scale? Because it's fairly specific. Scale is about some relationship. It's about some input and some output. That's what it is. There's a relationship between those two. Some kind of input that results in some kind of output. Sometimes it's linear, sometimes it does this, sometimes it tapers out, sometimes it goes downwards, then your business is gonna tank, it's fine. <laughs> you will pivot, because that's the thing you do. But here's the trick. The moment someone says, we need to scale, ask them what do you want to scale, and then they won't know how to answer you, then you draw these axes and ask them to label their axes. It's as simple as that. If you can't label the axes, you don't have a scaling problem or you don't know what your scaling problem is. That's it, label the axes. So in a case like this, number of photos shared as an input, number of photos reshared. That's what we're after. If we share more photos, we want more photos reshared. That's what we're after. And that's maybe what we want to scale. Once you figure that out, you've got to understand the relationship. As a flat, geez, this thing renders awful. It's just, just a point, Keynote sucks on Mac, <laughs> right? Um, 
you start off here, you kind of get to a tipping point, and generally that's what we want. All of us wish for this as a business. Um, but you've got to know what that profile is. What are you playing with? How do you figure this out? What's your profile? You have the data. It's your data. You should know that. You should know where you're at. And so most of the time, well, let me put it this way. The last scale conf was about two years, that I spoke at was about two years ago, and I was talking about how you use data to answer these kind of questions. It's that thing, right? But you've got to know that relation. You've got to know that profile. And that's where it starts getting really, really interesting, because if you're here and you want to play here, that's your challenge. For the things on those axes, not everything. It's not everything. There's certain parts that actually need to scale and some parts don't, and that's okay. You can come to ScaleConf next year and say you only scaled two services. It's fine. No one's going to say you need to scale all your services in order to enter the conference. <laughs> they won't. It's a nice community. We're not like that, right? But this is when we start getting into the messy part. If you figure that out, and you've designed for this side, now you want to design for that side. That's the hard part. That's what Jessica was talking about as well, and many others at this conference and previous conferences have been talking about. I try to figure these things out in very simple terms. So you figure out that you need to scale something. It is what is needed. If you don't do it, your customers get upset with you, your business could lose money, etc., etc. You've got to change something. You don't have a choice. You have to change something. And that's, if you choose not to change it, then you stay where you are, and you put your head in the sand, and life carries on, and you won't get your Series B funding and all of that. Now you have this problem, is that you butting your head up against the architecture that you had designed, or someone else had designed and now you've inherited. But it's yours, whether you like it or not. So many teams I work with, they'll say, but it was the previous people that designed it, now I've got, it's yours. You took the job, <laughs> right? If you didn't want that architecture, you should have taken another job. But you took the job, so it is yours. So we, we stuck with battling the complexity of the architecture. And that is the battle I see most of the time. And it's not a trivial battle. So there's something about complexity and change and scalability. And it seems to me that change creates this relationship between complexity and scale. And it's something I'm still trying to figure out. Because they're both complicated things. Explaining complexity is difficult. Trying to understand it is difficult. Trying to extend scale is difficult as well. And change in itself is incredibly painful most of the time. That's why we have Agile, right? It makes pain less. And then you have program increments if you're using SAFE. Right, so let's focus on complexity. I always think of it in two parts. There's domain complexity on one side and architectural complexity on the other side. What I notice is that any significant organization or business, the domain is fairly, it's, it's a sizable thing. You can't necessarily fit that entire domain in your head. You can't think about everything in your head at one shot. You take slices, you put it in your head, you think about that, you reason with it, and then you move it out, then you put another part in, you think about that. And that's why we end up with the larger number of teams to actually think about different parts. It's vast, not necessarily entirely complicated. So there's vast domains, large surface areas, with peaks of complexity here, there, and in a few places. But because we grapple with the complex parts, we think the entire domain is complicated or complex but it's not. 
So if you think about your work, your systems that you're designing, the businesses, there's parts that are complicated. But not all of it is complicated. If all of it is complicated, that's a nice project to be in, actually. Then we have the architectural complexity, the thing that actually makes the domain come alive and makes it useful to all the customers. And that has its own complexity. And that is something that we are in control of. Domain complexity, we don't have control over it. It just exists. We chose to be there. This side, we have control, up to a point. This is how I used to think about it. We need to balance out the complexity of the domain and the architecture, and it kind of, if we keep that balance, it feels all zen and life will be fine and sustainability, all of those things. And in recent times, in the last two, three years, I've realized it's not a balancing act. There are particular circumstances where there are different complexity and it's acceptable. In a case where the architectural complexity is lower than the domain complexity, and there's no need to scale up when you're somewhere here. It's actually a pretty damn good design. It's an elegant design. There's a simplification that you create that makes that domain come alive with the smallest number of moving parts. Does that make sense? When you're just starting out, you're dealing with, this, with enough of the domain, but your architecture can come up with something incredibly elegant. It's those moments where it's like, aha, if I solve that problem, I've, I've enabled lots. In the past, I've done this kind of stuff with, with domain-specific languages. I spent a fair part of the last 10 years using DSLs to solve complex problems, and you end up with a few moving parts and some incredibly elegant architectures. That's one case of a good design. Then, this may also be a good design, because you could take even the simplest of domains, upload a photo and share it, but at a certain amount of scale, the architecture exceeds the complexity on this side. It's as simple as that. In order to deal with vast volumes of data, incredible number of concurrent connections, all those kinds of things, this starts becoming a lot more complicated. And I say it may be a good design. If you do it well, it is a good design to solve that kind of complexity. But it's not always a good design. So there's two cases we have seen where there's good design. There's also bad design. We have this complex architecture when you're still playing in the early stages and you have absolutely no need to scale up. It's over-engineering, right? And so you design this incredibly complex architecture for actually a not-so-complex problem. And that there happens more often than we like, either in part or in the whole. Microservices, which I am not trying to shoot down, I do believe it has its place, is a good example of a bad design when not scaling up. It serves a very specific purpose. Again, should I just remove the highlights? Give me a second. Just give me a minute. Delete, delete. Delete, delete, play. How's that? So if you're doing anything with microservices, you should be reading stuff by Sam Newman, amazing guy, right? And someone here, Boyan, had said, he feels that it's often a bad choice for brand new products or startups, and Sam says, who's written two books about it, that, yeah, he's been saying that for a long time. Now Martin here says, folks like you and Boise, James uh, Lewis, have been consistent from the start about the effectiveness of it, right? And, and it is true, it's my experience as well, right? Now, 
So Zen Kaiser is an amazing software developer uh, residing in Hamburg. She's been keynoting for the last few years around uh, microservices at various parts of the world. And she does this amazing, amazing talk. And I just tried to create a little share of that. Let's see. Will it play? How does this thing play? Doesn't? Yes? No? Yes? Let me go back. Play. Keynote does work. Do I click on it again? There we go. So look at how it ends up building out, right? Everything you need to do to get a microservices architecture to work. Watch. For that thing. You're going to do all of that. All of that. It's crazy, right? Circuit breakers, bulkheads, balancers, everything else, including CI, CD. It's crazy the amount of stuff you end up having to do in order to get that to work. And I find a lot of, a lot of teams suffer from what I call microservices fatigue. It's not just that you need all of this, but look at the language being used here. It's a completely different language. Your primitives, in order to construct an architecture, is using a completely different vocabulary from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's different stuff, and you need to understand that language in order to make meaningful sentences in your team. So when you talk about you know, distributed tracing, we hope that everyone else on the team understands what you mean by that. So it's incredibly complicated. I'm reading this book by John Gall, who's a pediatrician, retired and passed away, but a pediatrician. And he studied systems. And this is what he said. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be patched up to make it work. So it basically says, don't start off designing something complex because you'll fail. And we've got few people here, Airbnb, Facebook. In the past, we've had other people from Spotify and others at this conference. And I'm almost certain, based on this finding, that if you ask them today to start from scratch to build the complex architecture that they have at the moment, they will fail. Because it didn't start like that. Exactly what Jessica was talking about as well. It didn't start with those kinds of services version 2, which took three years to get to, didn't start like that because of this, right? So how did microservices come about? So interestingly, James Lewis Boise was talking about this, um, was actually with this bunch sitting in Italy before COVID-19, a few years back, and we were talking about these things. And it comes from a few places. It comes from enterprise integration patterns, continuous delivery, REST, domain-driven design. A whole bunch of people just happened to be battling with the same problem at the same time. And we never use the word microservices. We use a whole bunch of other language. And then as he said, if Martin Fowler names it, it gets stuck. The name sticks. Uh, Daniel North Castaport was fighting for the naming of replaceable component architecture. It's actually a pretty accurate description. But microservices became, thing, became a thing. And it was in response to what was happening at that moment in time, which was big vendors and the enterprise service bus and all of that stuff. It was genuinely inspired by the domain-driven design people. We were also sitting in that same spot in Italy at the same time at that conference for the weekend. And so people like Udi Dehan and Jimmy Nielsen and a whole bunch of others also came about this. Again, architecture and domain. So big message. Don't start with microservices. I love this slide from Suzanne. That's what happens. It can easily end up with that. And if you layer the domain-driven design stuff around that as well, it just is a mental overload. right? So I've been asking, do you know when to shift to microservices? And I thought of three things, concurred with a few people. Uh, your team scales up, and you start stepping on each other's toes. It's as simply as I can put it. 
you're trotting over the same code by too many people. It happens. You're, you're running 24 by 7. You need to release in parts uh, and scale different parts independently. Legitimate reason. Just deploying the entire chunk each time is problematic. Third one, which uh, also happens, you're experimenting. You, you're off the ground. You're working. Your product is in market. But you're exper experimenting with alternative offerings. And so you need to have an architect that allows you to experiment. Drop something new in place. Try it out. Take it away. The key thing to this kind of architecture is actually the replaceable part. If you drop something in, you should be able to take it out. Not roll back. That's different, which is not allowed. You should never roll back. So what we're after here is that where you can experiment, throw something into your architecture, pull it out, and life carries on without drama. That's what we're after. So microservices for me make sense here. You are trying to scale up. The architecture is genuinely geared for that and is justifiable. What I find is this, unfortunately. I was guilty of this as well many times in my life, and I've got to check myself. Sometimes, not your ego, also my ego. My ego wants it more than the business needs it happens at conferences like this where you look at in awe of the amazing things that other companies have been achieving, and I want some of that. However, your business might not need that right now. Maybe one day it will, and then you'll come back to what you learned here and you'll use it. But it's got to be justified by what the business needs. This is the next thing by John Gall. He says, a complex system that works it is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. Two important things here. It evolved. The next most important thing is that the simple system worked. You've got to make the simple thing work. So don't do this, and I see it happen, especially in large enterprises that are trying to scale. They'll, the simple thing doesn't work, then they'll change the flavor of the day and start building something that is supposed to be better, but the simple thing never worked in the first place. So make the simple thing work, and then you evolve from that. Who's doing serverless? Anyone serverless? Who's thinking about it? You know what I'm talking about, right? OK. Because that's the simpler microservices, right? But is it? So what's different about serverless? You've got monoliths, which you know. Uh, you've got microservices. Serverless is different. It's very task-oriented. There's something that triggers the function to execute, and then it achieves a simple thing in a very finite period of time, preferably very short period of time. Okay. So we used to think like this. Now you start thinking like this, and then you start thinking like this. You might end up with a combination of both or all three. But it is different. Firstly, the, the, it's easier to fix design mistakes in serverless. That's what we've learned. It's also the smaller radius of change, which is good. The bad news is that Hello World is a distributed architecture. <laughs> so. QED, it's not simpler microservices and don't fall into that trap, right? It has its point and it has its purpose. So Goiko Adzik uh, has some great talks about this. And the good news is that serverless has an economic payback very quickly if you do it right. Because it's burst compute. So you reduce your Corpus, your AWS bill significantly if you go with serverless and if you do it right. But it's rewarding you for good design. So you, if you have a bad design with serverless, you're not going to get that economic payoff.
but genuinely it rewards you for, for good design. So it's the first time in my life of software development where you get rewarded for good design monetarily. Genuinely, your costs come down. So check out Goico stuff, and you'll see that. So what are the reasons to move to serverless? The same reasons as for microservices, this type of stuff. And if you have a good microservices design and you switch to serverless, your costs will come down. Your compute costs will come down if you do it right. So in all three cases, I ask myself the question, what is common to success? Boundaries in the architecture and boundaries in the organization. That's what it comes down to, that. What do I mean by that? It's that you've got to focus on the boundaries. It's put teams closer to the things that make sense. It's Conway's law, which, which you should figure out, which is about how you organize your teams around the information architecture of your organization or your business. Right? So move people into, into the parts that make sense. So again, I'm going to blame Keynote. There's a line that goes around this cluster of three. This works with that. This team works with those two. That team works with those two. And I've introduced this word called bounded context, which is, comes from domain-driven design with design in the large, which says that there's a cohesive unit that kind of makes sense together. right? So the way you plan this out is that you put teams to look after the bounded contexts as it makes sense in your organization. They become domain experts and architectural responsibility for those two things that go together. It's hard to talk about this if we don't talk about coupling. So there's a 1970s book that I always refer to which has some strange uh, language, programming language examples in it, but it's by Jordan and Constantine called Structured Design. It's out of print, but you can get it. And that is the physics of software. It describes coupling and cohesion, and nothing in that has changed since then. So what is coupling? I sit in many teams, and there's architecture and design arguments, and people get very animated about it. Like, what is coupling? It says, oh, we can't do that. This is coupled to that. What do you mean? Anyone? You use the language. Don't lie. You used it yesterday. What do we mean by coupling? This calls that at runtime? Mostly, right? And we say you want to reduce coupling is that they shouldn't call each other. It's true. That's one way of thinking about it. But it actually goes back to this thing of change. Coupling is that if I change A, I don't have a choice but to change B. Therefore, A and B are coupled. Change, not runtime dependency, change. I'm changing this piece of code here. Forces me to change the piece of code here. They are coupled at the act of creation. That's coupling. So if you find yourself having to change here, change there, change there, change there, those things are all coupled to the point where I now say it's change coupling to force the thought into teams. But that's it. It's about the change, nothing else. And if you understand that, your life becomes a whole lot more difficult, but also a whole lot simpler. And then cohesion, which is the flip side of it. Sometimes, and often, I want to be able to control the things that change together like A, B, and E, when I change A, I'm going to change B, and I change E together, and it's magnificent. It makes sense for us to do that. And I'll change all three, and I'll deploy all three. And D and C will change together. That's cohesion, which means that when I change any of those three, I don't change these. That's a good place to be in. Right? So that's what we mean by cohesion. The issue here is that I've been talking a lot about architecture, and why do we, should we focus on the architecture? Because we can get away with bad architecture, and it's true. Look at WordPress. 
No, I didn't say that rollback. It's gotten better, right? It's a lot more pluggable and componentized architecture. Why do we focus on it? Because it comes down to this, software delivery performance, and it's not just about velocity. So velocity and quality. So speed and quality. And you want both. And how many times have you caught yourself in your life saying to your boss, well, if you want speed, you can forget quality. And if you want quality, I will take long. It's not about that. It's both. It's an and equation. This and that. That's what we're after. And we measure speed with lead time, that is from commit into master to deployment and production. That's lead time. And we talk about deployment frequency, how frequently you deploy, that's easily understood. And in quality, we talk about change failure rate. That is, every time we introduce a change and deploy it into production, it causes a failure. So how, how often does that happen? And then, when we do have a drama in production, what's our mean time to recover? Those are, those are variables to measure your speed and your quality. Now, here's the interesting thing. So, by the way, if you're not measuring those, just start measuring those, and your life will get better. All right? Just start measuring it. Why is it important? Because it's directly impacted by your ability for continuous delivery, which comes back to all of these things that you hear and read about at this conference and many others. Loosely coupled architecture, trunk-based development, a whole bunch of stuff, right? But what we know is that, what I found out, is that good architecture is important, but it's not isolated. So remember this bit, right, about the axes, and we talk about outputs. But what are the outcomes? What is your business really doing? It's not about resharing photographs. It's actually about connecting people, people showcasing their talent. That's an outcome. It creates value for the customer. It's a difference. Output, outcome. And it's important to know that because that's the long play. The short play is to reshare. The long play is to connect people. The way you go about understanding this is to map that flow from customer takes photo, shares a photo, answer, another, fo another customer views it, other customer shares it, more customers view the photo, and you go back and you get that effect. That is mapping the flow. And if you want, you should be talking about you know, how performant it is, what's the latency between each of those, etc. The thing is, when I hear people talk about flow, talk about uh, value stream mapping, which is, this is a trivial, incomplete example of, I don't hear enough people talking about two things. The first one is governing constraints. Governing constraints are things that are hard and fast rules, that if you break it, it breaks badly. It should not be violated. You violate it, you die, right? And it does limit what you can do, which means that you've got no control over it. You just have to live with it, so design around it. In a case like this, customer, you might say the customer opts into a Creative Commons full attribution, no derivative, no commercial usage license. Customer has to do it. You've, it's a hard constraint because of photo sharing. Must honor privacy laws such as GDPR, etc. Hard constraints. They govern the entire architecture and the flow. You're not going to get away with this. Then there's enabling constraints, which are a lot more relaxed. They're guidelines or heuristics, right? You can relax them if you want. Or you can adapt it. Or you can throw it away and use it as an escape hatch, depending on what you're trying to do. Cases like this, we could invent this. Things like images cannot exceed 5 megs. 4 to 3 aspect ratio. Customers cannot download images. We might invent these enabling constraints because it simplifies certain things to allow us to get to market in a very peculiar way that is still valuable can invent these. You can also mean that because you invented it, you can remove or add to this. Right? So understanding what your enabling constraint, making them explicit, becomes a fantastic design tool for you. It takes options off the table and can put options on the table based on that. So if you're talking about 
things like constraints or flow, think about enabling and governing constraints. I've been using that incredibly lot in the last few conversations with companies I work with. Why is flow important? Comes back to lean, affects software delivery performance, again, right? So it's about architecture and flow. And we're talking about all three. They affect software delivery performance. I did not invent this. Sorry, I'm gonna go back, someone's taking a picture. There you go, all right, <laughs> got it? This is a better picture, it comes from this book called Accelerate, Jez Humble, Jean Kim, Nicole Forsgren. The nice thing about this is the causal map. It says that, for example, it says this, if you do it well, has a positive impact on that, has a positive impact on that, has a positive impact on that, and vice versa. The nice thing about this is this is a defendable thesis based on research. It's not thoughts, it's hard research. So if you haven't read the book, get the book, read it, buy it for everyone on the team, buy it for that guy that's doing this and the guy that's doing that, right? Because this is defendable. Interesting things pop up here. Things like continuous delivery has a positive impact on less burnout. How's that? Hey? And a whole bunch of things around culture as well. So I'd say do that. And this is what I've figured out is that you design for outcomes, connect people, things like that in this example, and you scale your outputs. Two different things. How do we deal with that excess complexity? A few common scenarios. First one, shared database. I didn't draw the lines, it gets messy. The other one, enterprise service bus in the middle, giant queues in the middle, and everything talks to each other via that and the shared databases. <laughs> Fake microservices. You got monoliths, et cetera, and you call these things microservices, but they're still, it's a mess. And if you put your monoliths on Kubernetes and you put Kafka, it does not mean you have a scaled solution. It just, it's not, right? It's not because you use that. It doesn't mean that. There's a whole bunch more. Here's what I've noticed in every scenario. There's a risky path to production. What do I mean by risky? It's unpredictable. It takes long. You have no idea whether it's going to succeed or fail. You've kept a weekend aside for the fallout. <laughs> you are already prepping by buying snacks the week before release. <laughs> Ask for budget for pizza and all sorts of stuff. You can fix this, you start with the flow. Always start here, and then deal with the architecture. If you've got no flow problems, you won't have an architecture problem, I guarantee you that. And focus on the boundaries you want. Different scenarios, it could be on that end, fairly simple, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. It could be spread across. It could be spread across even more. But focus on the parts you want. Imagine that you've isolated that, that part, right? So you're going to focus on, con don't focus on consistency firstly, of size, it's irrelevant. It's about coupling and cohesion and governing and enabling constraints. And then map the path to production with the thing that's in your head. Imagine how you'll take it to life. When you start mapping it, there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes up. How do I test it? How do I secure it? Where do you configure it? Where does the code reside? A whole bunch of stuff that forces you to think about that. And you map the production, map the part of production of the old stuff. Same thing, forces you to think about it. Key is to automate all the new things you do. Automate, automate, automate. If you automate, you get quality. It's predictable. And you de-risk your deployment. In detail, a little bit lower down, you can create a parallel op uh, implementation. That is, build a new thing, deploy it, just leave it there. When you're ready, switch it over. It starts getting uglier before it gets better. Another is to tap the data. You might take a small percentage. The, call, the calling system or application is calling that. 
put in a T piece, take some of the data, divert some of it to the new stuff, see how it goes. It might be a duplicate, it might be a full divert. Over time, divert all of it. And then you've deprecated this one side. Principally, that's an approach. This makes sense. Kent Beck has been talking about this a lot. Make the change easy, then make the easy change. The first part is the harder refactoring to do. But put the effort in, which is keep it clean. So, you may well need to scale down. So I'm suggesting you look at flow and then architecture. Evolve from something simple to something complex. And if you really, really want to scale up, you've got to take leadership and culture into play, into play as well. And it doesn't work otherwise. I guarantee you, it doesn't work. You need strong leadership, strong culture. They support that, and this starts falling into play. So that's me with my keynote presentation from a Windows machine. Thank you very much, everyone. Any questions? Raise your hand and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Here, Mike. So, starting out developers, mid-level developers, they keep on hearing things that are going to make their careers better, so they see, you know, CV-driven development, uh, and then they work in the cloud often, which means they get told you're working with a distributed system. And we now have Kubernetes, we before had DevOps, before we had that we had Agile as the silver bullets fixing all your problems. How do we teach more of these startup developers that no, you don't need distributed systems and no, you don't need all the fancy toys? Okay, so the question is around mid-level developers, people getting into the business and suddenly you, you're facing what I put up there, right? The, the fatigue of everything else and you're facing a distributed system. I don't think we're going to avoid that. I think that is the way we're going to do it in the future, right? And that's unavoidable. Uh, we have a responsibility to onboard people who are smart, intelligent anyway, to understand the new language of distributed architectures. Um, and then if I had to go backwards in time, which is what I've been arguing for, is that the schools that produce these in incredible minds should be teaching distributed architecture as a first-class concept because that's where we're heading towards. It's hard to not do that anymore. So a lot of emphasis goes into teaching people that this is the way we do it. And like we taught people before, this is how you build a simple MVC application, and MVC was a big deal. We had to teach them how to do that. It's the same thing. I don't think there's a way to avoid it. Anyone else? We good? Yes, sir. Wait, wait, wait. Hey, in the last slide you had leadership and culture. This one? Yeah. Could you maybe just elaborate on those? Are you just referring to stakeholder buy-in or? Oh, buy-in is just a just budgetary thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, leadership and culture, come back to this slide, right? Okay, this is research, right? So we want great organizational performance. We're finding that it is directly related to strong software delivery performance, speed and quality. Speed and quality is directly related to this from an engineering side, and those two from a flow side, understanding the product and the customer and the business. Both do not come to bear if you don't have this kind of leadership that creates that kind of environment. So you need visionaries who understand these things, create psychological safety, et cetera, et cetera. You need to have that kind of leadership that understands that. Incredibly hierarchical, patriarchal organizations are unable to do this unless they change here. Many of you may have felt that bump from the engineering side going upwards, and you hit that wall of someone's door or someone's office that stops you from doing that. And if you look further at the top, Look at this interesting correlation. Continuous delivery, follow that arc all the way up to organizational culture. All right? So there's a causal effect between continuous delivery, organizational culture, which affects software delivery performance. 
So that's what I mean by that. Those things have a huge impact, and it's now stated by fact that this is what's happening in the world. High-performing organizations get this part right. That leadership and that culture thing, these are intermediaries, right? Answer your question? Yeah, thanks. It's great. Okay. Fire boss. That's what said. <laughs> right. Great. Anyone else? At the back? One at the back. <laughs> All on your side. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm interested in the intersection of things like Conway's Law and things like Agile with a capital A, particularly SAFE, which you mentioned. And what I'm seeing a lot is things like SAFE are forcing architectural change because they're very interested in very small bits of work that are easily measurable, that are easily compartmentalized and easy to explain to people. And my worry is, is that those kind of things are influencing architecture unduly and in quite a kind of subtle way that because you're forced with this, not just the shape of your organization, but the way it's run uh, is leading to these things. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. So you mentioned Agile, you mentioned architecture, you mentioned SAFE, the methodology. And? Particularly how SAFE wants to see oh things Lord. packaged and how work I, gets packaged up in SAFE. Okay. I worry that it unduly affects All architecture. Right. Okay, so SAFE is like the bad child of Prince having unfortunate relationships with Agile. It's just, I know many organizations that are large go for safe. It's, and I'm not being facetious here. I haven't seen it being successful. It's created an organizational overhead that prevents moving forward, right? And so be very careful. I'm not saying stop what you're doing. It came in for a particular reason in many organizations. But I'm finding that chaos that moves you forward in some unspoken way is even more powerful than a regimented way like release trains and program increments and all of those things. They, we don't think like that. The world doesn't work in that regimented way, unfortunately. And so when we start talking about experimentation, etc., SAFE doesn't take into consideration those kinds of human behavior things. And so this particular map is directly in contrast to what SAFE will do. So unfortunately, if you're stuck in that program increment cycle, I'm sorry. Cool. All right. So if you want to continue that conversation, find a safe space outside. <laughs> I, I have to apologize. I have to, I'll be around for about half an hour, then I've got to head to the airport, and I hate it, but I've got to do that. So Great. catch me if you can. Thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. Nice.